So we'll make a start, because I, I do like to keep on time. Uh, and uh, so, right, welcome to Health and Wellbeing Overview and Scrutiny here on the 7th of November. Apologies for absence. We have apologies from Councillors Hardy and Councillors Chicken. Right. Any from the floor? I see no one indicating. Right, let's move on. Uh, minutes, minutes of the previous meeting held on the 12th of September, pages one to six. Anybody want to bring up anything in here that is not on the agenda or any corrections in anything that was said or done? Move acceptance, Chair. Thank you, accepted. Disclosure of members' interests, anybody? Oh, we're making good progress. Uh, Health and Wellbeing Board. The minutes of the Health and Wellbeing Board held on the 14th of September 2023. Uh, any scrutiny or issues considered there? Pages 7 to 12. Anybody? We do have a possible joint with... That's with fax, sorry. Coming up, so that will take its course. Right, item five. This is the meat of the meeting today. I'd like to welcome ladies who we got. We've got Nicola Kenny. Hello. Uh, Gail Jones. Yeah. And Vicky Conroe. Right, welcome ladies. Uh, this is the uh, NH Foundation Trust Oncology Performance update. The floor is yours. You use the microphones if you can. Oh, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invitation. So last time I was here was probably about a year ago. It uh, so was around our annual accounts. And certainly the, the committee picked up some of the deterioration that we'd had in our cancer waiting times performance and had obviously had some, some concerns around those, um, equally as, as the trust does at the time as well. And it was really an invitation to come back and give you an update in terms of all the work we've been doing in terms of improvement. So there is quite a lot crammed into the, the slide pack, which I'm sure you've got. So I just really want to kind of go over the headlines for you in terms of where we currently are. So overall, we've seen some improvement across the cancer waiting times. The ones that we've drawn out are the two-week waits, the 28 faster diagnosis standard, the 31 and the 62-day first treatments. From the 1st of October, we are being held to account for delivery against the new kit cancer waiting times. Um, and it's essentially the 28 day, 31 and 62 day, the two week wait will disappear. Um, having said that, you can see we have had some improvement um, across some of the, the 28, which is more of the focus. So our quality account for two week wait was 76.1%. As at the end of August, that had further deteriorated to 68.2%. Um, and there's some reasons for that which I'll come on to. It's primarily due to we get a lot more referrals through now for cancer waiting time. So part of the, the government's plan around restoration was patients didn't come forward um, for their GP referral during the pandemic. So you, could, you really saw the referrals tail off. And there's been a lot of work done to get patients to come forward, get to their GP and get referred into the service. And we're seeing now our two-week wait referral demand is exceeding what it was pre-COVID, which is good so patients are, are coming forward for their cancer diagnosis and their their treatments so in reality we are seeing a lot more patients within two weeks it's just not reflected in the, in the percentage performance another reason for that is we are in, we've developed our patient pathways so as they come through the cancer services we would normally have a first appointment with a consultant for a, a lot of pathways now we're looking to bring patients into a diagnostic test so actually cut that first step out in the process and we call it a straight to test, so it actually gets the patient in quicker to get an earlier diagnosis or not and get cancer ruled out. So some of the deterioration is, is due to that and we're just not re we're reporting it in a slightly different way, which is the 28 FASTA diagnosis standard. In terms of the, fan, the, the FASTA diagnosis standard, um, that's been, it was a national target to be over 80%. And um, that was in the cancer ambitions, but on the back of the pandemic, um, they did delay that coming in and the target that they set for, for this year was 75%. Um, we have been exceeding that all year until 
uh, until August, where we saw the figure drop, and we've also got a dip in September. But we did have significantly high referrals of your skin uh, referrals coming through in the summer, which we always see that peak. So our trend is it would increase during the summer months, and all the campaigns you see on the TV in terms of sunscreen and all of that ge generates quite a lot of activity. Um, and what we did see was unprecedented levels, and that was ported nationally as well. Um, so yes, it's a, it's a great thing, but a huge uh, volume of work to, to get through in the time scales that we've set. So we fully expect the 28 facet diagnosis to recover. And the challenge for next year is to achieve 80% by 25, 26. And again, the work that we're doing around best practice time pathways, um, so that's measuring every single part of the pathway, we'll be able to really shine spotlights on some of the pressure areas that we've got to really focus in and target some improvement work. In terms of the 31 and the 62 day challenges, um, again, slight improvement in performance compared to what we presented in the annual uh, account. Um, lots of in-year challenges. Probably the, the main one was in relation to our lung cancer performance. We had some challenges with the workforce of theatre staffing. Um, we've now got some agency nurses in, we've got additional theatre capacity, and we've started to see those weights come down um, dramatically for lung cancer performance. There's a lot of work that we do collaboratively as well, working with other partners, uh, making sure we get a timely referral. And um, we did try and do some work with South Tees, but again, equally, they were having similar challenges around waiting times. And probably the other one to mention is the industrial action in terms of some of the challenges we had around treatments. In terms of the planning for industrial action, we always protect our cancer and our urgent cases. Um, what it means, it pushes some of our routine cases out. But in terms of just keeping on top of everything that we're doing, making sure we've got two-week wait slots for patients coming through, um, and making sure we've got the resources directed at cancer, it was just, it's quite complex in the planning round. So again, quite a, a big challenge, as well as the skin. In terms of the 62-day standard, that moves to a, a, a target of 70% from March next year as well. So that we are behind in terms of where we currently sit, but that becomes slightly more achievable in March. And that's recognition where we are as a, as, um, as a country um, in terms of most trusts are behind where they are in terms of cancer waiting times. I'm just gonna skip to just some of the key actions in terms of the improvement work. There's a lot of detail. I'm happy to take questions if you've had a chance to kind of go through the slides. Um, but I'm just going to skip to slide number seven. Um, this is what we get held to account for by NHS England, so they're very much interested in how we're performing against the 28-day FASA diagnosis standard and how we're performing against our backlog. So these are the patients who are in our 62-day backlog. Some of these patients will not end up having a cancer diagnosis. They just haven't got to that point yet. Um, and what we can see is that we're off trajectory in terms of the October position, 393, and that's largely because of some of the skin. It did start to grow around the August period. Again, we had some lung and some prostate delays in there, uh, which is coming down. But the graph below it's probably the more important one. Um, and this is how many patients we treat within 68 days. It was a snapshot in May. The team's just ran that again for me for the last month, and it's a very similar pattern. So we will treat... 85% of our patients within 98 days in the tail where you've got the ones, two, three patients right up till you've got somebody at 217 days there. It's very much like a complex patient or patient choice uh, where we see that patients have their delayed treatment. And it's usually in the, the, the likes of the lower risk uh, cancer tumour areas. Um, I don't know if I want to bring Gail. Do you, Gail, do you want to come in here just to kind of describe some of the, the rationale why patients kind of delay their treatment? Yeah, I mean, there certainly is always an element of patient choice that's critical. So um, my background is as a haematologist, so quite a nice example is low-grade lymphoma, um, which is a condition that we don't, unfortunately, treat to cure, but we treat to control over time. Um, and if patients need to start treatment, they will often work with us to define a time when it would suit them best to start if there's no immediate urgency to begin. Um, a patient may have an important family occasion or a holiday or something, and so sometimes we we have to build in those um, times. But we don't we don't want to uh, record the patient as not requiring treatment. That would be inaccurate. So we keep them on the list until they actually go ahead with their treatment. But it's 
it's not, I think it's fair to say, Nicola, it wouldn't be every patient at the end of that tail that it would be choice, but that is certainly a good proportion of them. It's just going back a slide. So as a tertiary centre, we get referrals in from um, all over the country, all over the, the northeast as well, um, for specialist and complex treatment. So you can see on the graph there, it's not the, the lens of legend's not very good. So there are standards where we expect to get a referral in from a, another hospital within 38 days. So the ones that are within target are the green. And those that we get beyond the 30 days are in the red. And that poses a real challenge because it gives us a much shorter period. We run out of time in terms of that 60-day target to try and get the patients in, have the diagnostic results pass through to us and actually do their treatment. So we're working with all of This has got worse. Um, and you can see the volumes increasing as well. So we're seeing a lot more tertiary referrals come through to the trust. Um, but we are working with all of our neighbouring trusts locally through the Cancer Alliance, really targeting in what we can do to kind of get that back on track in terms of the 30-day referral to us, or even sooner. I mentioned the best practice time pathways. That's a, a sequent target for all trusts. So we're all working on developing our best practice time pathways. And that is about measuring every step in the process. So when trusts are starting to really look at the, every point in the pathway, it will look, hope at the end, the expectation is that it will drive improvement and we'll get patients hopefully in sooner. There's a slide towards the end of the pack there, just on the, some of the key actions. Um, I've mentioned the straight test. There are other things that we've done. So we... I mentioned we've had some in-year challenges. Um, we've, always, we've always had the patient trackers who are actively tracking patients through the pathway, expediting any delays where they can and escalating. We've increased capacity in the lung cancer service that I mentioned. Um, we've got patients who've been transferred across to Cumbria who's got some additional capacity. Um, we've managed to get daft as a brush to support with that work. We've mentioned the late referrals. Diagnostics is another area of... Uh, again, just a bit of a bottleneck in the, in the trust and in the system. So as we're seeing more referrals come through, we need more patients to have those diagnostic tests, which is your MRIs, your CTs, your endoscopies. Um, we've got an extra endoscopy suite in the hospital now, which is great in terms of that, their performance. And in terms of MRIs and CTs, we've got additional mobile units on site. Um, they're across the, the hospital sites, and we've got them on a temporary basis. There are plans to increase our MRI capacity. There's the mistake works. We need the, the, the MRI to be put in place. And there's also the work that we're doing around the community diagnostic centres, which was on the back of the Mike Richards review a few years ago. And we're working alongside Gateshead in terms of that development, which is expected to come on stream, certainly not until next year now. So there's lots going on in terms of improvement. We're still not where we'd like to be in terms of performance but we are certainly making improvements across all of those pathways and dealing with those in-year challenges as and when and being very much reactive to the situations that we've got, but also in, the, in parallel working and planning to make it so, so sustainable, like extra diagnostics on a sustainable basis. So happy to just ask colleagues if there's anything that I've missed they want to bring in. Yeah. Shaking your heads, so... Uh, Councillor Hill first. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, needless to say, these figures are really disappointing. I mean, you're looking at numbers on, a, on bits of paper, but you're thinking about people who um, potentially could be very seriously ill or die because they're waiting for treatment and they're not getting. That's the bottom line. Um, in terms of what's also disappointing, what gives confidence um, is accurate forecasting. So in a business, you know, if a business says, you know, we're going to lose money in quarter three because of this reason, but we'll be profitable in quarter four because of this reason, and that happens, you have confidence in what they're saying. What concerns me is when this came up in the quality account, we got assurance that the figures would get better, and in fact, they've got worse. So that sets alarm bells. Um, in terms of how much control have you got of the situation? How much have you got an idea of the solution to this issue? Because you gave us assurance. And I remember you saying, it will get better. And I said, well, we'll wait to see what happens. And my brain told me, I'm, I was a bit sceptical. I've been proven right. that This is what's happened. It's got worse. And so my final question is looking at these um, stats and the sort of defence always seems to be, well, we're not good, but 
everywhere else is bad in the country as well. I mean, is there any comparable data internationally? You know, that would give us a much wider, because I would suspect that this performance nationally uh, it doesn't stand up very well in most countries across the world, certainly in the you know, developed world. I can certainly come in in terms of, you're absolutely right, in terms of the deterioration in the two-week waits, and there's, there's, that, there's the rationale for some of that in terms of how I described that straight-to-test pathway. So that was a, a, not a planned deterioration, but it's just happened on the back of changing pathways, and hence the, the, the government are, are removing that two-week wait standard. Um, in terms of faster diagnosis, that has improved, and I absolutely take the, the 31 and the 62 days, very, very small, slight improvements but we are absolutely treating more patients than we ever have done before when you see the volumes coming through. So there is something around us, I see, managing some of the acute pressures that we've got when things happen, you know, in terms of theatre and nurse staffing and trying to address that too. And it's very much, we're on a road to recovery. Uh, we, we get hit with some challenges. It, it is some short-term solutions that we have to put in. What we really need to be focused on is those longer-term solutions, which is the changes to pathways, increased diagnostic capacity, and actually doing lots of work around the workforce as well. So where we can't recruit, we are looking at alternative skill mixes and changes in the way that, that we have that workforce. So in terms of the, the assurances, in terms of all the improvement work, they've all been certainly con they've continued over the last 12 months and will continue to do so. And we are anticip we, we will have to do some forecasting for NHS planning for the next year round and make some assumptions what that means in terms of what we're going to have a workforce, diagnostic capacity, what we think will happen to referrals, um, and obviously working with our partners to make sure we get timely referrals in. I can't answer the question on the international figures in terms of what, what might be about there in terms of off the top of my head, but certainly something we can go away and have a look at, unless colleagues can have looked at that before. Um, sorry, I'll just, I, I don't know the international data off the top of my head. We can certainly have a look. I think it's fair to say that there, I don't know of other countries that monitor things in exactly the same way. So it's how do you make the comparison might be difficult, but I hear you. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, you know, the figures are disappointing and I appreciate there's more people coming forward, which is, it's nice that people are actually ask, coming forward to think they've got a problem and they're getting diagnosed. Uh, when the new hospital opens in Berwick, will there be the oncology department in there so that people can access it locally? I appreciate any treatment or surgery will need to be done in a bigger hospital, but it's just the diagnosis. And also, are you doing more PR to try and take away the risks to people? Because some people will be high risks, explaining their diet, smoke and alcohol, but also telling them that, you know, if you notice this, please come forward, which, yes, it's going to increase your numbers, but at least if they get diagnosed quicker, there's maybe more chance of survival. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. One of the national priorities is to diagnose people at an earlier stage for exactly that reason. Um, and that is the right thing to do. Um, and one of the big areas that we're involved in, for instance, is the targeted lung health checks. So looking at scanning smokers. So the idea is um, that you pick up uh, tumours at an earlier stage, which can be taken out surgically rather than and cured rather than maybe controlled with chemotherapy for a, a period of time. So it's it's the right thing to do. That in itself puts some strain on a strained service when you implement these things. So we've been working very hard with the region really to look at, for instance, cardiothoracic capacity and things like that. Um, so in that sense, yes, and, and targeted lung health checks are a really good example of something that we're involved in. The other thing um, we're implementing, most places to be honest, are trying to implement this more and more is patient initiated follow-up, which is quite difficult for patients sometimes. Um, they've been through a real life-changing event and uh, often their expectation is of ongoing follow-up from the specialist. But where there's no evidence that that adds additional benefit, um, we're trying to set up systems where the patient can be supported perhaps by the team rather than necessarily by the consultant so the consultant can see more new patients. Um, 
So when we go through that process of patient-initiated follow-up, one of the really clear things is if you find something new. In my line of work, it's often if you find a skin lesion, uh, if you start to cough, go for your breast screening. It's that reinforcement of all the, the health messages. Um, I, I can't, Nicola may be better than me at answering the specific question about Berwick, but um, I don't know whether you have been involved in this, what we've called the, the non-surgical oncology review. I know that's been at the joint um, oversight and scrutiny group. This is about trying to find new ways for our oncologists to work for exactly the reason that you point out. We, we, can't, we can't have everybody everywhere, but how, with that knowledge, can we help patients be treated closest to home? So... Um, the question there is a very specific question about the oncology chemotherapy delivery in Berwick, and I'm afraid I, I can't specifically answer that. That sits within Northumbria Trust as a delivery uh, point. Uh, but we can certainly come back to you as what their plans are. But we're, we're very much working with the whole region, with the Cancer Alliance, to do exactly what you say. Get the patients to a hubbed appointment when they need to see a particular person, but try to deliver the care as close to home as possible. Um, so that's very much the agenda for that non-surgical oncology review. Thank you for that. Okay. Thanks, Derry. Derry. Thank you. Uh, Derry Nugent from Health Watch Northumberland. Um, and thank you for that. I think it's been very comprehensive. Um, I think one of the concerns I always have when Newcastle Hospitals just comes to present to us is the context about, well, where is the thing, where's Northumberland? What does this mean for Northumberland? And I think sometimes disaggregating Northumberland, if you can, from some of those figures is much easier then, for, for certainly for me, <laughs> than to interpret and then to obviously talk to the public about. So I think when you're talking about um, some of those figures, I'd like to understand what the experience is for Northumberland residents, because I think the point you just made about closest to home we know that travelling to hospitals, even in the circumstance where people are going to be very pleased to be being treated, the travel, the, the, you know, the support, all of those things are more difficult the further you are away from Newcastle. So I think it would be helpful to have some of this contextualised with Northumberland. And I think the point you also made, which is about Northumbria. So actually, for us to understand the complete picture we probably do need to hear from Northumbria at the same time as you, so we understand the full pathways for people and what it actually means for people in Northumberland. I, th I think that's very fair. Um, yeah, I think that's very fair. I think we can disaggregate our outcomes, our, our targets by postcode. I think that's possible. It's not something that we would routinely do. We tend to look and... and make sure we've got sort of parity over the patch. I mean, I think Nicola alluded to it, and it is, it is absolutely the truth um, that patients who are referred into us, so from another secondary care centre to our centre, um, so I've just done a piece of work about patients who have waited more than 104 days for their treatment. And, you know, we're, we're making no bones. This is not what we want it to be. Um, but we've done a piece of work on patients who've waited over 104 days, and um, you know, I would like to provide assurance that actually the harm caused to patients when we've gone through our, 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 the, the last four months of data is, it is very low. And I think that does demonstrate that what you're seeing sort of means here, you're seeing average times, but what is happening in the background every week, twice a week sometimes, is clinicians are looking at the lists and they're putting the patients that they're most worried about up to the front. So there's not a list, and if you join at 10th, you're treated 10th. There is an acuity assessment made constantly to bring the patients at most risk forward. So I, I believe that is why with our weekly and sometimes bi-weekly meetings, with clinicians and um, operational managers looking at lists that we're actually minimising harm. Um, we don't want any harm, um, but, but that does provide some, some assurance. But the point I was going to make with respect to Northumbria is there are 
a larger proportion of our tertiary referrals are in that 104th day group than are in the original referred population. So if um, maybe 60% of our patients, um, let me get the thing right now, um, it, I think it was 40% of our workload, roughly speaking, comes from outside. But our patients who wait more than 104 days, it's roughly 60% of that group. So this time taken to get to us has a knock-on effect in the time taken to treat. So uh, your, your point's well, well made. We can try and pull out the Northumberland data because I, I suspect it will be, well, I think that will reflect what we've demonstrated with our long wait. Right, I'll ask one. Um, in the last, say, 50 years, there's an awful lot been done, you know, warning, no smoking in, in public buildings and no smoking here, no smoking in pubs. The, the, the work that it is done to prevent, to prevent, to prevent. And I, I know people are living longer, but the numbers still seem to go up. Mm -hmm. Is it just because they live longer and they're more susceptible to, you know, wh wh where is the answer? Because I'm, I'm quite convinced in a few years time, Vapes will have a warning, this will damage your health, or, or they'll, they'll be, and if it's not vapes, they'll find something else. You know, where do we go to get the trend down? Yeah, yeah that's a really good question. I mean, I guess the, I don't know, did you want to come in no, on that? I'll, I'll, I'll for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, I think, I think the demographic of the population is a big part of this. So as people get older, you will see more cancer. There's no question of it. Um, and I, not in any way to excuse our figures, we want our figures to be better, but I think we do need to bear in mind that we're looking at a, a snapshot of the incidence of cancer when we look at these figures, so we're looking at cancer when it occurs and what happens when that patient is first treated. But it is also true, and it's a, it's a great thing, that for many patients, cancer is becoming more of a chronic illness. Not for all patients, and we would love it to be better, but we're dealing with a very different disease than we were dealing with 10 years ago. We're, we're dealing with a disease where, where patients can live with their cancer often for many years. So we can't, for instance, just suddenly say, stop doing all those uh, CTs, just screen these cancer pathway patients, because if we do that, all the patients who are waiting for their repeat CTs on their chemotherapy monitoring, which now goes on for years, not months, can't be scanned so so we've got that whole we've got the the demographic we've got the patients living with their disease we've got more treatment that we can deliver to more people than we've ever been able to do you know that there was a time i've been in hematology oh golly 25 plus years we, we used to not do a bone marrow transplant in anybody over 40 that was how we started and we now do bone marrow transplants i think our oldest patient is 75 so we, 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 in 25 years, it has changed beyond belief and the types of treatment that the oncologists use have changed. We harness the immune system um, where we never could do that before and we can treat older patients. So the, the whole landscape is, is different and it's really, really important that we get people picked up quickly, no, no question. But we also have to think about this issue of of prevalence of these people living with it. And your point about care close to home is, is right, because if, if you're gonna have chemotherapy for three months, you can probably travel anywhere. But if you're gonna have chemotherapy for four years, that, that's a different beast altogether. Um, so I, I don't think I can answer your question, but I'll maybe pass to a colleague who may, may give a better, a better okay. answer, but, but you may um, it's different. Okay. Is your mic on? Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, for anyone who... Uh, I think I've been around the block a while, but I'm Jim Brown, consultant public health at Northumberland County Council. So, um, so in answer to your question, I think it's a, it's a really good question. It's the million-dollar question. Um, about 40% of cancer is preventable. Uh, the biggest risk factor is smoking. And I think there's a number of reasons why we see, you know, we didn't see numbers come, total numbers come down, you know, as we've heard. One is for the historical impacts of smoking. So a lot of the lung cancer was the very the high rates of smoking 
really well into 1990s, early into 2000s. So we're still seeing the impact of that, uh, you know, in terms of the, the lung cancer rates, which is one of the most common and biggest, one of the biggest causes of people dying. But of course, you are right. If you, you know, as you, one of the biggest risk factors is age for cancer. Um, I think the, the thing that we need to focus on as a system is around reducing the inequalities and reducing the premature uh, incidence of cancer in particular. And that's where addressing those risk factors that you've mentioned, smoking, alcohol, weight, physical activity, are really, really important. But also we need to make sure that we're thinking about you know, what's the variation across different communities and how can we reduce some of that. And so I think you know, that's where we want to particularly focus it. But I'm afraid the numbers in total... You know, there is a factor of actually if you live longer, there is going to be increased, uh, there is going to be a larger number of people living with cancer. But actually, as we've heard, it's a long term, for many people, it's a long term condition and can be, uh, and can be managed and people can live well with cancer. Because when I got on this council many years ago, the Labour group was sort of, you know, the ruling group was miners or former miners and heavy industrial stuff is now sort of moving out of the figure fi or should be starting to move out of the figures because that you know that was back in the 80s or beyond so are, are those figures of, of, of that cohort that goes through as i say dying out or are they, are they getting things that they sh would not normally get had they not been in heavy industry Oh, that, uh, again, uh, difficult to, f to fully answer that, but my observation plus what I know from the evidence and the data is that, I mean, for, for most people, that heavy industry finished pretty much in the 80s, you know, certainly coal mining around here in, in, in much of the northeast, and, you know, a lot of the impact we have already seen. But, it's, but the biggest, although, you know, coal mining and obviously exposed to asbestos in, in the in, in the shipboarding industry and other other industries have had a big impact on cancer and particularly lung cancer and co you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and pneumoconiosis smoking is still the biggest it's the biggest single reason for people dying or losing any years of of good health uh, and it's still got to be the absolute focus of i think of, of us as a system of the health and well-being board in northumberland it has to be around tobacco and I think they, that'll, on Thursday will be an update of the Tobacco Partnership at Health and Wellbeing Board. Sly Hill. Just another quick point, a um, bit of feedback. Obviously, it's frustrating and very worrying, the delays in getting treatment. That, that's one side. What we get time and time again is residents, not just that they're getting delays, but it's the lack of communication. I mean, I had somebody, obviously, I'm not going to give the details, but waiting for an operation in the RVI, it was cancelled, and they've tried to call up, find out about times or another, and they're just not hearing back. And the communication around all sorts of treatments really is clearly poor and needs to be improved, because that is, I don't know about others, but that's feedback I get a lot, a lack of communication. Only to say that's absolutely something we want to get right. Um, we had a we had a strategy day, gosh, a month ago, where we're just trying to work for a, a strategy for the cancer specifically for the trust, which we're hoping to put forward at the start of the new year. Um, and I guess as a group of clinicians, that was something that came out. We were trying to think whether there was something we could put in at the front end of a pathway where you get a person or a phone number. Um, where a patient could have it to try and get that communication because it's terribly frustrating, isn't it? If people are, you know, worried in pain, you know, can't get it around in circles. So um, the, the problem is it, there's no good having a very generic number. You have to have it quite specific to the department. Otherwise, you just not get fobbed off, but you don't get the specific answer that you're hoping for. Um, so we need to work with individual teams to say, what have people got that's working well? Um, and what can we do in other places where it's perhaps more challenging? Because it costs, in any organisation, doesn't communicate. So if you said, look, I'm really sorry, but it's going to be between 50 and 70 days. If you can bring it forward, we'll let you know. But, you know, that's fine. But if people aren't hearing and they're ringing up or turning up at places, then that costs more time rather than if you get it right in the first place, time. communication. So I'm glad you raised it internally, though. 
any more. Les. Thank you, Chair. Looking to the future, what do you see? Uh, do you see uh, the service improvement? Do you see um, technology uh, being more advanced in the detection and the technology for treatment of cancer? Do you see uh, society uh, adopting to change its uh, way of living, as it were, smoking, uh, dietary matters, and all sorts of other things? Um, what's your take on the future as experts? Um, so there's a, there's a part of that that's relatively easier to answer than the, the other part. Um, and I think I, I, as much as cancer is a devastating diagnosis, of course it is, I think the future for cancer care and for cancer treatment is rapidly changing and getting brighter. Um, I think that will have a huge impact on our services that we need to respond to because the the need for services is going to actually increase because more patients can be treated for longer. I think there is, I guess there are two sort of very apparent technological changes that are here, stroke, on the point of here. One is molecular medicine. So no longer, um, so my husband happens to be a lung cancer doctor um, and he no longer can show a slide of squamous cell cancer and adenocarcinoma. That was the, that was the slide. Um, he's now got a myriad, I, I, I couldn't even tell you how many, molecular subtypes of lung cancer. And that's important, not necessarily because we give a fancy name, but because the drug companies are now targeting the molecular mutations. So if you have a patient with an ALK mutation, you can give an ALK inhibitor. So we're going to see that more and more and more and more and more. And the national rollout, I think, is probably going to be around um, whole genome work on tumours so that you can pick out, it might be a colon cancer, it might be a lung cancer, but if it's got the same mutation, the drug may actually work for both. So I think we're going to come into an era of more personalised medicine, more precision medicine, and very much down that kind of molecular route. I think from a, a technology perspective, so I think Nicola may have a, a different view or may, may come back on it, but I think the, the big thing of interest is going to be AI and what is that going to do. Um, so we already use AI in our radiotherapy uh, department because one of the issues around radiotherapy is what we call outline the organs at risk. So if you're treating a prostate cancer, you must make sure that the bowel is screened so that only the prostate gets the radiation, otherwise patients get colitis, inflammation of the bowel. Um, and we can now use, so historically, um, Dr. Pedley, one of my um, predecessors in this role, used to laugh that he was drawing circles because he would go and he would draw around the prostate and then he'd grow, draw around all the areas that need to be spared. And that sparing of organs at risk can now be done by AI. So instead of having to have two clinicians plan, you can have a, a machine plan and a clinician review it to check it's okay and then you proceed. Um, and we're also looking at um, AI to look at, for instance, chest x-rays um, to see whether they can pick up a lung cancer in a chest x-ray. Partly because the machine should be good at picking up lung cancer, but also partly to take away a tranche of work from for normal x-rays that then clinicians don't have to spend time looking at the normal, they can focus on the abnormal. So, so that's already coming and I think it's going to be absolutely fascinating to see how that develops. So we were looking at it, we had a presentation looking at DNAs, don't, do not, did not attend, and there are various packages that can pick out characteristics of patients who don't come or can look historically at postcodes where patients don't come. And they can target your intervention on certain groups. So, so you can do more work if there are certain populations that maybe don't don't come so often or struggle to come. So, so I think that those are quite easy questions to give you some flavour. I think where is society going is a very difficult question. I mean, you may be able better, Jim, than to speak about it. But certainly, smoking is getting less. 
Um, but as the population gets older, um, other, other cancers will happen um, because that's the nature of ageing. Um, but Would you like me to answer? Quickly. It's a really difficult answer from a public health and prevention point of view. Uh, I think ultimately there are policies and decisions that are within our gift that uh, you know we may or may not choose to make as a society. Well, I don't know if anyone saw Look North today. And it was from Dortmund. And they were blaming Eddie Howe for the future of liver diseases coming to Newcastle with all the drinking from Arsenal, Man United, and then Dortmund tonight. So, <laughs> on a light note, I've got no more hands, so I kind of thank you for your attendance. We will probably have you back again to see, you know, hopefully that a, turn, a circle may be turned, the strike issue might be out of the way, and you might get into clear water where you can actually bring some numbers down. Okay, thank you very much. I'll let you. I'll, give, I'll just give you a couple of minutes to, to break out. Item six: Report of the cabinet member for improving public health and well-being. Well, we don't have that, but we've got Jim. And update and refresh on the joint health and well-being strategy theme, adopting a whole system approach to health care. The floor is yours. There we go. And thank you, Chair. Um, appreciate that. Um, so the committee will be aware that the Health and Wellbeing Board uh, recently can reviewed the 2018 to 2028 health and the joint health and well-being strategy. And they agree that whilst it was fit for purpose, and the themes are still relevant, the actions need more detail and the measures of progress uh, need updating. So I presented this report that I think that you've got in your pack to the Health and Wellbeing Board on the 12th of October. And we had, there, there were two aims for the report, to update the board on achievements over the past five years. So to do that bit of a look back, you know, what has been achieved despite, uh, despite COVID, and that was for the theme of adopting a whole system approach to health and care. And then the second aim was to refresh and propose kind of amendments to the priorities, the actions, and the indicators or evidence of achievement for this theme. So we recommended um, to the board that they note and comment on the achievements described and agree to the proposed amendments to the priorities, actions, and indicators and evidence of, of achievement for the future for the next five years. And then you'll, you'll be aware that the other three themes of the Joint Health and Wellbeing uh, Strategy are being will be presented over the over coming months. And then really actually in the new year, what the intention is is to, you know, from comments and views and, and that we would really welcome from you, and incorporating, I think, what comes from the county, the development of a county plan as part of this new Northumberland County Partnership. And then that can be incorporated into a refreshed kind of second five years of the joint health and wellbeing strategy. So what I'm happy to do is I can summarise the report if you would like me to do that, uh, you know, for the committee. Or what we could do is to move to kind of share what system transformation board, which is who has kind of ownership of this theme and what health and wellbeing board what some of their comments were, and then to take questions. So I'd really just, you know, you may well have read in detail, and I know some of, some of us have uh, been, this might be the third iteration that some people have uh, listened to, that, but I know for committee members that might be different. But I'm happy to kind of go through that briefly or just move to kind of questions and, and summarising what were the comments of previous boards and committees. Would you like me to summarise? Yeah, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Okay. So this theme of adopting a whole system approach, health and care, it's one of four themes from the Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy. And the overall aim of this theme, which is, is there are no plans to amend, is to maximise the value from and sustainability of health and social care and other public services for improving the health of the people of Northumberland and reducing health inequalities. So I think there wasn't too much to, you know, there wasn't a need to change that. 
you'll be aware that there's a Northumberland System Transformation Board. That's now also the place committee of the Integrated Care Board in Northumberland. And they agreed to take ownership of the theme. And I led a cross-sector group uh, with you know, colleagues from Adult Social Care, Health Watch, uh, the, the different trusts um, uh, from, 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 from quite wide representation. And we did what we, what we said, we reviewed some of those achievements, proposed those, some of those changes which are in the report. So you'll see that up until now, the, the, the theme had three kind of key priorities. The first, refocus and prioritise prevention and health promotion. The second, improve quality and value for money in the health and social care system, as brackets integration, which always felt was a bit clunky, so proposed some changes there. And the final is ensure access to services that contribute to health and wellbeing are fair and equitable. So the report, I think, it outlined some of the achievements um, you know, in this past five years. I think since the key thing, and you know, coming back to really what we were talking about with cancer, since 2017-18, for, for the around prevention, health promotion, has been the really remarkable improvement in, in smoking prevalence. And actually, it's, it's, you know, it's always you write a report and then the data gets updated, which is one of these issues. Have, but smoking prevalence is now below 10% in Northumberland for the first time for the general adult population. Still well above that for people working in routine and manual occupations. So coming back to the point that you made, Chair, earlier. So, but the, that's a success story. And really what we want is to have, you know, with some of the new policies, a smoke-free generation, you know, to get that below 5% by 2030, which will be a challenge, but actually I think is achievable. Some a kind of more modest improvement around physical activity, which I've tried to kind of share, and I can go into some detail. It's like, if anything, a worsening trend in alcohol-related hospital admissions. So we're still, as you've pointed out, Chair, with your point about Dortmund and Eddie Howe, we're still across the northeast, well above the, uh, the national average for hospital-related admissions related to alcohol. Sorry, alcohol-related hospital admissions. Also, when there was self-reported well-being, that kind of took a dip in COVID and has kind of returned to pre-COVID. But I think that's more of a kind of indicator of right across the system. So I think probably the biggest setback to, to all of achievement has been the COVID pandemic. But actually, it, I mean, it feels like people are really chasing each other. The amount of work that's going on, I think, right across the system to, 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 to get back uh, on track is really evident. And I hope what we've done is kind of just try to summarise the work across tobacco, drugs and alcohol, healthy weight, physical activity, sexual health, oral health, physical health checks for people with severe mental illness and low disabilities, NHS health checks, and, and making every contact count. Now, for the indicators related to integration, a kind of slightly more kind of mixed picture, there's been minimal change for social care related care, report, care reported quality of life, or people who use services who feel they have control over their daily life. Permanent admissions to residential and nursing care homes, I think as we put in the report that that had reduced uh, up to 2021, 22, I think that has kind of uh, uh, risen back up and uh, uh, Neil and team would be able to comment on that. Um, we did, what was also in there was delayed transfers of care and this has been a big issue over the years. They were increasing for Northumberland, but you know remained well below the England average. We certainly you know punch above our weight in that way, but they're not measured in the same way. So we are pro proposing actually that they, they get removed because there isn't really easy way. We've just said about benchmarking cancer services. There isn't really an easy way to benchmark against you know well, what should we doing. Maybe there are other ways to kind of understand integration. But I think there were quite a few examples of integration across different sects, across physical and mental health, across. Um, health care and adult social care, and I think with, with public health involved supporting primary care networks. I think a lot of really good examples that should try to try to share in the report. Indicators of progress for the priority ensuring access to services that contribute to health and wellbeing are fair and equitable was, was probably the hardest. I mean, we've got data on um, the rates of common surgical procedures by deprivation as an example, but it's actually not useful for the very point you made earlier chair about about cancer because it's not hadn't been adjusted for age and sex and of course as you get older um, you know you are at higher risk of osteoarthritis in need of hip and hip and knee replacement so actually what what really is about embedding the systems of work you know what, what was talked about the dnas in uh, newcastle the same kind of work happening in northumbria on the auspices of the health inequalities program board and i think there were numerous examples tried to share there so what are, what, are, what are we proposing to change? Well, not to change first priority. Refocus on prioritising prevention, health promotion, I think, 
continues to be a priority. The second, though, we've just tried to be a little bit more specific. Drive integrated, coordinated, personalised care. That links, I think, really closely to what we've just heard. But also use and resident involvement in the health and social care system. And there's a real appetite to make sure that actually a resident, service user, carer, patient voice actually features in everything we do. And then finally, priority three, just a slight kind of change, but not just, not just about access. You know, as we just heard, I think, a question from the committee, it's also about the experiences that people have and the outcomes that people have. You know, we want to look at to the equity and you know, make sure that's equitable as well as a system. So the key new actions cover kind of early detection treatment of risk factors of cardiovascular disease. I can go into why that's a priority if, you, if you'd like. Physical health checks for people with severe mental illness or learned disability, and that's a, those are two groups who have some of the worst health, you know, of amongst uh, some of our most vulnerable groups in the, in the population. Around the development of integrated neighbourhood teams, I think that's going to be absolutely crucial, and I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. And as I've said, around service user resident involvement, screening vaccination inequalities, and, and, and embedding kind of health equity audit and looking at inequalities systematically, it fits with the inequalities plan. So there were a number of kind of comments from and there's some members of System Transformation Board and Health and Wellbeing Board here today, which I thought would be just helpful because there may be some of the kind of things that you are thinking about. What we intend to is actually add in around whole system approaches, thinking about sexual reproductive health and drugs as well as in, in, to get them in there as well. I think there was this comment that Jill O'Neill made about, you know, we often have different perspectives. What do we mean by whole system approaches? So I think there's a little bit of work, you know, that collectively we need to do that in back in System Transformation Board. How does it relate to the, the kind of three screening questions around communities first? You know, what can communities do for themselves? Where do they need some input? And where do services need to kind of take that lead? There was a question um, from Terry around, well, how can we embed dentistry? Because that's actually the biggest, one of the biggest concerns that our population have. It doesn't kind of fit easily, but we've just definitely taken on that board so that we can incorporate. We have got, you know, approach, a whole system approach to, to oral health. And I think that is important because it's, it's coming back to actually the cancer. It's both about the prevention and water fluoridation. We'll probably come back here, I would have thought, in the next few months. Uh, you know, because actually there's proposals for the whole region, for the whole country. Um, but it's also then about how do we get that kind of early, early, uh, uh, early access to, to dentistry. There was actually really strong endorsement. You may have heard around integrated neighbourhood teams. They were proposed in the fuller stock take of general practice, but actually right across all sectors, people are really keen on coming together around sort of small place, small areas, 30 to 50,000. It fits with our primary care networks, but the, of course the geography doesn't entirely fit. We have primary care networks that are quite disparate across our, our different areas. But actually, I think people really like the idea of linking with communities, with family hubs, and actually creating the services around communities and involving communities. I think really important that we dovetail the actions and the, and the priorities across themes, and then really just kind of find that we've got to be able to demonstrate you know, that change over the next five years. So absolutely pinning down some, some key indicators that we can monitor over the next five years is vital. So that, that was some of the feedback from the, the two boards. Yeah. Very happy to take questions, Chair. Great. <laughs> Prevention uh, is key, isn't it? Uh, and uh, good information is key about our health. So I didn't see anything in this that's related to education at school. Uh, the, I didn't see anything that, uh, um, any links to uh, providing a service at school, um, whether it's education or checks or anything like that. Uh, is that possible to fit into this plan? So, um, yeah, I think it, this, this is what we've hit, is that problem of you're not got it all at once, of the four themes. And um, at the last Health and Wellbeing Board, the theme of um, giving children and young people the best start in life, or what's going to be proposed, I think, to change it to starting and growing well, uh, which is uh, led by Audrey Kingham and my colleague John Lawler, they do feature, actually, really importantly, the, you know, the role of education. I think there are you know, great opportunities in education, but it's probably not the only way or the only thing. And obviously, you know, but, 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 but really important that actually we use those opportunities in, in settings, you know, like 
education and workplaces and in, in healthcare services. People are there already, so let's use those settings, you know, where they where there, there are, you know, they can't get away. <laughs> but you can, and, and there are a lot of approaches where we are doing that, but it actually needs to be right across the population as well. Right, Les, we have a joint meeting with Family and Children's Services on the 9th of January? 9th of January. So we can maybe tackle some of that there. And Catherine? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, thank you for this report, Dr. Brown. Uh, I just wondered about the um, uh, the updated data on the indicators for the joint health and well-being strategy. I see that um, for Northumberland, it's uh, for the rate of hospital admissions for alcohol-related conditions. It's uh, rate per. 100,000 is 768 versus 494 for England. So I'm just wondering why it's so much higher here uh, in Northumberland. And the other thing is the smoking is down in Northumberland versus England. But I just wondered, um, for the rest of England, I just wondered about the, um, the vaping, you know, whether that's not... Um, I don't believe that's regulated, is it? And I just wondered if that's considered safe in your view, and that is increasing. So perhaps people are not smoking as much, but they're now vaping, and I'm just wondering if you're addressing that in any way at all. Yeah. Thank, thank you, excellent questions. I really, really appreciate those. I, I mean, I think, in answer to the question is, why do we have higher rates of alcohol-related hospital admissions in Northumberland compared to England? We have them right across the northeast, and actually Northumberland is probably slightly better than the rest of the northeast, but still considerably worse in England. Um, uh, I don't want to be as glib to say it's because we drink more, but it's ultimately about you know persisting social norms around around alcohol use, you know, right across popula different population groups, um, and, and certainly you know around how we, the kind of kinds of uh, narrative stories and, and discussions we have with children, you know, coming back to, you know, around, around use of alcohol and how they're exposed to alcohol. There's, but there's so many different impacts. Um, I think, uh, you know, we have balance, which is uh, the equivalent of fresh. It's, uh, it's what e each of the local authorities in the Northeast fund to uh, do uh, additional work around uh, uh, linking around policy, around campaigns, around work with lots of different groups to reduce alcohol use. Uh, and, you know, there is uh, a region-wide strategy, an awful lot of work that goes on locally and, and, and regionally around alcohol. I think it is a, it is a huge issue, the marked inequalities. We know that people who are, live in our more deprived areas are more prone to a lot of the harms from alcohol. Uh, so at the same kind of level of drinking, they're much more prone, more prone to some of those harms. So it's a you know really complex issue about you know what are the reasons. A lot of it is going to be cultural. It's going to be around social norms. But actually, you know there are quite a lot of things in our armory at a policy level around minimum unit pricing, which we increasingly think is likely to you know be a benefit, but also reducing marketing uh, and 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 some of those. Uh, other kind of policy issues that we think could make a big difference and so that's what we you know we work with balance to help us make sure we've got the right evidence when we're talking to to yourselves and you know other politicians uh, around how we influence some of those policies at, at a national and regional level so coming back to the smoking and vaping i mean um the, the 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 view from most public health professionals is you know that uh, vaping is considerably safer than smoking and no point would we want to say that it was safe but um, we do recognize that vaping has a key role in helping people to stop smoking and I think we've seen with the cancer rates and what we've already discussed that you know smoking is the single biggest killer it's the single biggest uh, you know, impact on our health, and it's absolutely vital that we reduce that. We know that vaping is a really key reason why we've seen some of the reductions in smoking prevalence, and it, and the evidence is very, you know, of its effectiveness. However, you're absolutely right that I think all of us are really worried about what that impact is on uh, children, young people, uh, and we've seen that you know 
all sorts of stories of toilets and you know huge weights of toilets because so many people are vaping in those toilets. There is an awful lot of work that my colleague Carrie Lynch has kind of shared, I know, with Health and Wellbeing Board and is coming on uh, on Thursday to Health and Wellbeing Board to, to share around vaping. Um, I think we just need a balanced approach. We need to regulate it. We need to prevent it being sold to children and young people. We need to make it less less glamorous, you know, all the colours and a nice kind of sweetened uh, vapes that, uh, that, that people can get hold of. Uh, and we need to make it so that it, you cannot uh, buy disposable vapes at the really cheap price that they're currently available. And these are some of the things that we fed back in the consultation around vaping recently, along with our colleagues, other colleagues in the North East. I don't know if that answers sufficiently, but really happy for my colleague Carrie Lynch, who leads on tobacco, to you know have a chat with you as well, if that would be helpful. Yeah, just, just one more. I just wondered, it is, so there's some work that's going on about the regulation of, of, uh, of vaping. Is that, when is that, um, uh, when do you think that will be put in place? Do you have any idea? Uh, I think we need the, we would be waiting for a response to the consultation from government, which of course, I, I, I wouldn't expect it to be too long, but I would have thought it would be in, the ne in, a, in a few months that we would have a response and the, the legislation and regulations would change. So I would think into the new year when we see an outcome from that. I think we've learned very little over the years. I mean, there's footage of... Uh, cigarettes being sold in hospitals in the 50s, 60s, 70s even. Uh, and here we are, the problem, they're targeting kids because it's kids that will then go on to other things. So mm -hmm. I don't think we've learned a lot. Um, and I, I don't know how you stop it because it just comes in and they, they seem to take it as if it's a big game. Right. Any more? Isabel. Thank you, Chair. Just to say, are you working with the inequalities group? Because Northumberland's a very diverse county with many different issues as to health-wise as well as financial-wise. And I think it's just how you can, you know, what, there's no one fit all. So it's, it's, I hope you're working with them to try and pick up, you know, that community is that a problem, that community is that, and how we can work to help everybody where we can. I mean, uh, yeah, absolutely. I would say that the inequalities plan isn't just a group. It's, you know, the, that's something we've all signed up to. Um, I, th I think you're absolutely right that inequality is at the heart of everything we do in public health. And I think what we're trying to do as well is to make that, that, that it's just the norm to look at all data, cancer data actually as well. And I think, I know, I'm not, I can't remember who made that point, but to look at some of the cancer data and uh, you know, by deprivation and by other by protected characteristics where it's possible, because we know that there are differences in uh, you know whether we look at outcomes or whether we look at risk factors or whether we look at access to services. And I think you're absolutely right that the more we can do to to, to do that, the better. And I think that's what health equity audits are about. It's what the Health Inequalities Programme Board, and there's a, something very similar in, uh, in Newcastle, but the, that Health Inequalities Programme Board at Northumbria are doing, it's absolutely vital that, that, that that runs through everything that we do. So I can absolutely promise we're, you know, there are very close links and that, we're, that that's probably the most, that is the most, to be, together with the corporate plan, that these are the most important parts and it's obviously a key feature of the corporate plan as well for public health. Anyone? I can't say it. Morning. I'm just thinking of um, our society in Northumberland. Um, we've got different levels of poverty. Um, some of the poverty is caused by um, employment legislation, uh, the gig economy, and so on. Um, is there any reference within this and the plan to? Uh, look at that sector of employment and uh, the poverty levels within Northumberland because of uh, uh, the way that employment has been downgraded over the years, uh, where it's not secure and so on. Is, are you planning to put anything in that report about this? So, um, it 
I'll probably come back to that to the same reply. Actually, you, you know, when you question about education, it's one of four themes, and I think you you know you're absolutely right that it's the conditions in which people live which determine the, the how their behaviours in terms of uh, their ability to look after their health. And I think you make absolutely the right. You know, employment and housing and education; these are absolutely key in skills, and economy, and income. Benefit, welfare rights, you know, so all of these things are absolutely key. Uh, but there is another theme that will be coming to to overview and scrutiny, which is around the wider determinants of health. So I, th I would hope that that was covered here. I think what this theme is about is about how can we work collectively between kind of healthcare, public health, adult social care, and other parts of the system to really focus on some of that illness prevention and uh, access and reduce inequalities access and how does integration, personalised, coordinated care, service user involvement influence and you know improve the quality of care and improve outcomes for people. But absolutely, well, I would say that at the heart of everything, it will, you know, it would be all of the, the things like employment and housing, education, which are, you, which are absolutely key to, to, to people's health. Yeah. Right, thank you very much. Uh, we'll obviously have you back some time in the future where we'll uh, again pick up whatever we think is, is relevant. Smoking and vaping is obviously a, a concern. Uh, so thank you. I can't, uh, we just accept this report and. Yeah, this is. Um, members have given their feedback. So we've, comments. You, you've had a bit of feedback, so thank you very much. And see you whenever we see you next. Seven, report the cabinet member for caring for adults. Welfare rights report 2019 to 23. Uh, I've got down Wendy Patterson, but I can't see Wendy Patterson here. So, Keith. Keith and Neil Bradley. Keith and Neil Bradley, right. We'll give it a minute. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, Wendy gives her apologies that she can't be here for this, so I'm just going to say a few words to start, and then I'll hand over to the real subject expert on my right-hand side here, Keith Thompson, who manages the welfare rights team for us. Yeah, uh, we used to intermittently bring an update report on welfare rights. There hasn't been one for a little while, and we felt it was timely to bring this back again to update uh, overview and scrutiny on, uh, on the work that goes on within that section. Uh, I mean, I think there are two key functions that are performed by the welfare rights team in adult social care, which Keith will go into in a little bit more detail. But in reality, we provide expertise to adult social care uh, and advice and training uh, on benefits issues and make sure that we support the vulnerable adults that adult social care deals with to, to, to the best of our ability in terms of maximising income. But also that service is widened out to the wider council as well and potentially partners uh, where requests come in uh, in terms of sharing that expertise. The other key function that Keith's team perform is the horizon scan on changes to the national benefit system and try and anticipate some of the impact on that for residents generally in Northumberland, particularly, again, vulnerable residents and those with disability uh, that we deal with. So a couple of key functions in there uh, that we try to pick up, and this report is, is just a little run through kind of what that team's been doing for the last few years uh, since we last brought a report through to you. So I'll hand over to Keith now for that. Thank you, Neil. You've covered nearly all the points I was going to, so uh, <laughs> you saved a bit of time there. Uh, just very quickly, I'll just run through, referring to the team. The team are a small team, but three welfare rights officers and a part-time welfare rights officer, plus myself and some admin support. Uh, we predominantly support adult social care staff, social workers, care managers, these frontline staff who are out there dealing and trying their best to help people and inevitably, if they're going to have problems with income, they're going to be touching against the benefits system. And it's very complex. It's particularly complex at the moment because we've sort of got two systems. There's an old system on its way out and a new system on its way in. You've heard of universal credit. I think the last time I shared a platform with the chair, we were doing the implementation of universal credit in 2018 and we're still waiting for it to be fully fully rolled out. Uh, 
We also support more closely over the last few years Northumberland Adolescent Service and particularly support and care leavers. Uh, and that's been quite a, a learning curve for my team because they've now been sort of been familiarising themselves with that environment. But we're seeing there now as quite a key element, uh, particularly around the finance panel. So we're uh, trying to work out what the young people can claim and what they can't, because it's quite different rules there. But it means the local authorities not having to pay to support people if they can get the support through the benefit system. And that's something that we're working with them closely to make sure happens. So it's not just the individuals, you know, there is an impact positively on the local authority as well. Uh, Neil mentioned the training. Interestingly, because this is what used to be an annual report to become a four-year report, we've got COVID right in the middle. So we started off and our training was all face-to-face. -face. Then we had two years where about one or two meetings, it was pretty much virtual. But what's happened now is we're doing more face-to-face -face than we did pre-COVID, but we're also doing quite extensive virtual and online training. So we're probably now training about twice as many people a year as we were in 2019. Some of that's through necessity, because like I say, as things change, people need to be updated about it. Uh, so coming forward, we'll be continuing to do that and offering it to everybody. The training is an offer that has been taken up in the past by members, so if there was anybody wanting to discuss that, I'm sure through the appropriate channels, if that was a need, we would do our best to help sort that out. Uh, number of inquiries we receive. Because we help predominantly disabled adults, if the DWP prioritises things, for example, how many assessments it's doing with people on disability benefits, that tends to have a direct knock-on effect on the amount of inquiries we receive from social workers. Uh, so in the report, in the section about inquiries, section five, you sort of see over nine years, there was quite a peak in 2018, starting to fall in 2019, and that was pretty much entirely down to reassessments of adults on disability living allowance being converted onto personal independence payment, or PIP. And there was a few hiccups in that process and people needed to be supported to be able to challenge decisions or to complete review forms. So we were busy then helping social workers to help their clients with that. To get the best flavour of what we do and the impact, it's probably section seven, the case studies, where there's, I've tried to pick a representative sample where you get an idea of who we can help, the social workers and their client group, and what the outcomes can be. And it can be big implications on people and you know, we're addressing inequalities, but on well-being as well, getting somebody the income maximising it is generally going to be better for them and their well-being than them struggling with not enough to live on. Uh, Neil also mentioned sort of the looking forward thing and horizon scanning. At the moment, last in September, there was a consultation launched about so-called sickness benefits. But of course, that they're claimed, not just by people who may be been working and then become ill and need to claim benefit for a short while, but disabled people who may be never going to be able to work, they would also be relying on that for their day-to-day -day income. So that can cause a little bit of alarm amongst people with the uncertainty. So hopefully once we get a clearer view of what's going to happen, we can then brief the, the staff so then they can support people through whatever processes that might come their way. And really, if there's any questions, any I'm happy questions, to answer. Councillor Hill. Thank you. I'm sure, just sort of slightly offside uh, comment and, and question. You're talking here about um, how the valuable work you do navigating government policy and all of welfare. Um, it is very confusing, and, and you do need. Um, 
I always, you know, when you get residents asking, point them in the direction of some people I know who are, because it's very technical, isn't it, and all the benefits, and the sudden it's discretionary. I just wondered, in the whole sort of quality agenda, is there any role you have in putting input into government welfare policy, and even thinking quite radically about, um, I think the system would benefit from being simplified. And this, this intriguing idea that's often been floated about forms of universal basic income, which can take the form of, you know, everyone's guaranteed a, a basic amount. And they, maybe if they had a specific, um, you know, disability, there might be a, a markup, but just generally everyone's guaranteed a bit basic income, or one that everyone gets this extra add-on. And there has been talk about doing pilots in certain areas. Um, it's difficult to do a pilot on somewhere else. It's a small sort of focus, but I just wondered if you had any sort of comments around policy input and even potentially um, the idea that the rumbling could be a pilot for a scheme like this. Uh, I'm, I'm aware from time to time it, it keeps coming back, universal basic income. The, I, I think there's a pilot. There was talk of a pilot somewhere with a certain Charity, group of people. It? Somewhere. it was care leavers, I think. I think it was care leavers in an area that were experimenting, just giving them a basic income. Uh, and I can see why that might be attractive, because most of them, certainly at that time, <coughs> would be entitled to claim universal credit anyway. But having the basic income meant there's none of the bureaucracy around it. So that's the difficulty in them claiming, being supportive to claim. And that would leave those social workers to be able to focus on actually helping them get into work and become established and maybe finally move off benefit. But as far as the council goes, I mean, that would be a political decision whether we were involved in something like that. Yeah, just, just to come in as well. I mean, we, we are um, approached occasionally to assist with particularly the transitions that have been going on recently. We're sometimes assist, uh, approached by government departments to potentially trial some of the transitions that have been happening. I mean, as Keith says, clearly the actual policy of benefit is a political decision. We wouldn't get involved in that, but we would comment, if asked by government departments, on the impact of decisions that they're thinking about doing and, and how we think that may affect things. So, I think it's one of the conversations yeah. to be prepared to happen, because there's two sides. There's this equality argument and, and saving money, make it much simpler to give everyone that safety net. Yeah. Um, but it also, when you're talking about AI taking over everyone's jobs and things like that, that's what comes in at that side. So I'm not saying tomorrow, I'm going to say, where's your policy and input into it? But I think it's something to think about. OK. David Dow. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the report. And the case studies were very interesting because it shows what, you know, with you as officers have actually helped people get what they were actually entitled to. The question is, is if we get contacted by residents, you know, unsure about benefits and if they can play, is Communities Together the right place to divert them into so that they will come into the right way, right channels into yourselves? I mean, the, the answer you're going to get from welfare rights officers is it depends. Cause, <laughs> but uh, yes, if somebody's struggling and they've got an immediate need, then I would say no funding Communities Together is a good starting point. If you knew that person say, had a social worker or a care manager, I would be suggesting you directed them to them because then they can come to us and we can help out with the benefits. And then we work closely with the communities together. So if we pick up that there's something that can be helped with by them, we're, you know, we're, we're talking to each other. I meet regularly with Julie Leddy, the manager of that service. It's always handy to know to direct the people to the right place as quickly as I we mean, can. Generally, if people have debt problems, uh, citizens' advice would be, because we, we, we can only advise about benefits, so debt problems, we would usually be recommend people went to citizens' advice. All this talk of AI not be long before we councillors are replaced, do we? Exactly. Terry. Thank you. Um, yeah, just a question about frontline staff. Um, does it extend to social prescribers? Uh, we have done sessions for some of the social prescribers. Uh, when Generally, if they've been at a meeting where one of the welfare rights yeah. officers have been and picked up. So, yes. Uh, and also, we were asked and did uh, somebody did a session, just a short session, but uh, at Valens. Yeah. Uh, 
so that was for the full team there. I think but, that to me is a really important network. Um, I mean, I sit in an office surrounded by teams of social prescribers and sort of aware that those are the sort of questions they're being asked and, be, yeah. and getting involved with and helping people and that sort of take up issue so helping people claim because I think one of the things that we're aware of as health watch as well um, is that sometimes we're asked can you help me fill a form in um, now I have to say ex welfare rights officer well, sitting yes. here but um, you know where do we then send people to get an attendance allowance form filled in or what you know because that is one of the big gaps that people talk to us about mm -hmm. I mean it does I, you know, I meet with managers of the other services. So, mm -hmm. so Age UK, Northumberland, yeah. they've got a resource and they, mm -hmm. they help people at pension age. So certainly, and you have to be pension age to, yeah, to get claim attendance, attendance allowance. allowance. Yeah. So certainly older people, I would be recommending mm -hmm. that. Uh, it, if somebody lives in a carbon home, mm -hmm. they carbon guess, yeah. actually have a strong money and benefits mm -hmm. team across the patch so they can help their tenants with benefits mm. issues. And I think that brings me to my next point, which is uh, the fact that I think it's about those general benefit take up encouragement type issues. So unless someone's living in a carbon home, um, if unless they're um, you know in those networks, then actually we know that the take up of for pensioners especially, and mm -hmm. things around things like pensioner credit and stuff like that, is behind where it could be. Ha what role does the welfare rights team in the council have to encourage and to make people aware of those of what benefits are there? Because that, as with people of other people have said, it goes to that equality issue. Right. We've been doing so that through the support planners, which are now in the yeah. communities together team, uh, and they've been sort of trained to pick up and spot that entitlement and yeah. to help with those forms. Uh, we've had messages going through comms to mm. tie in with particular take-up campaigns, I think the most recent one's the pension credit. Uh, mm. And we have done it time to time with attendance allowance. I did have a, a look at the figures, and, and we've had various goes at attendance allowance, mm. including a period of employing people directly to do it. Mm. And they helped lots of people and generated lots of gains. But the overall headline figure <laughs> of the number of people in Northumberland didn't move that much. So you're not shifting, you're not shifting so the needle on it. Is that people who would have mm. got it anyway? Uh, I noticed that there's always historically been just under about 10,000 people on attendance allowance in Northumberland, and I did notice it's just under 11,000 on the last stats that came out. But I didn't correlate that to increasing size of the over-pension age population. Thank you. So, yeah, no, it is. It, it's a good point, and take-up has always been one of those things we do feed into, but... Right. It's not Les good. and Jim. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for your hard work, and uh, it's really appreciated. I know in my ward I've dealt with individuals and uh, their stories of uh, claiming for benefits... Uh, it turns out to be something of a horror story. Um, for example, you, you could be in hospital, lose your job because of your ill health. Um, you don't get any benefits until you actually apply. Nothing's backdated, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it has a, a financial impact on that person and family. The other thing is... Um, is the PIP system where you go to be assessed apparently. I don't know if you actually work with people regarding that. Uh, it's a nightmare for people and uh, they've got to go with all their papers, all their documents and argue the case that they are not fit, they are unwell. Um, apparently they even have to uh, acquire their doctors um, reports um, and I've been told of stories whereby they turn up with nothing they didn't realize that they had to do some homework um, so I hear these stories and I, I appreciate what you do and uh, it's just tragic isn't it the whole system is tragic 
The system isn't there to help you. The system is there to, uh, well, according to my residents, it's there to stop you claiming. So, you know, I appreciate everything you do. So do you work in those fields with uh, PIPs? And do you work in, in, say, people being in hospital where is there a possibility they could get their payments backdated? Do you take on the difficult cases as well? We, we only take on a very limited number of cases directly where we're involved talking directly to the, the patient in that case or, or, or the resident. Just by virtue of the size of the team, which is why we're trying to help at arm's length through the social workers. Uh, we have done sessions and we get contact from hospital to home teams and the social workers based in the hospitals. Uh, there's limited backdating on some benefits. Uh, or personal independence payment, I mean, that is something that we, we train and try and get social workers and care managers to support people with. Uh, if, it's, if they've not come across it before, welfare rights officers will go out and do the form with them and maybe go out again and let them take a lead so before they're sort of let loose and then they can always contact a welfare rights officer to get advice whilst they're doing a the form. So the idea is, and the training, the idea is, is to get them to spot that entitlement and think, all right, and to get those claims started as soon as possible rather than wait and if somebody's been in hospital for several months and then they come out and they're starting at that point, then there's likely to be some issues perhaps with rent arrears or mortgage and whatever else uh, when they come out if they haven't had support whilst they were in hospital. Uh, I mean, it is complex and it is bureaucratic. Right, I want to take Jim. Uh, thanks, Chair. <coughs> Excuse me. I just want to actually respond to Derry Nugent's question from, from Healthwatch about training social prescribers. Um, uh, and obviously, I think... Um, it's worth pointing out that we know from demand that, you know, that there's always a need for additional training, there's always a need for additional resource, and absolutely, you know, I, I think uh, the, the Welfare Rights Advisory Unit is absolutely punches well above its weight. But I did just want to say we, um, Public Health took over the commissioning of citizens' advice several years ago, and following that health needs assessment of benefits and debt advice, which was presented to Health and Wellbeing Board, we increase the the funding to citizens advice but also and the point i really really wanted to make was on the back of that we've managed to secure some funding from the some legacy funding from the ccg before it became part of the icb and that has been used not only to increase the, the temporarily i'm afraid the funding to citizens advice to provide you know welfare rights and debt and many other advice services but also to pilot um, some more intensive training for social prescribers in several of our PCNs, and we're just trying to secure some funding to evaluate that. And I think that will be, uh, you know, be really interesting to see what the outcome of that is. But I know there are really close links between the social prescribers and uh, Keith's team, support planners, Northumberland communities together. It's actually a really, you know, it's working really, really well. I know that the, you know, it's a, it is a whole system approach. I think, um, but but and they use frontline to make some of those referrals. But I think that form filling is still an issue. And I think uh, since advice worked really hard to get a lot of volunteers to support their work, and they have, you know, have got, but you know, they require a lot of training. But there's always that opportunity to increase the form filling. Anymore, I see nobody. This is what information which you've asked questions and said lots of things. So I'd like to say thank you for your attendance, and obviously we'll see you somewhere else in the near future. Thank you. Okay, I'll go on to item eight, eight point one, eight point one forward plan, Chris. Thanks, Chair. Um, the forward plan of Cabinet decisions taken since um, our last meeting and um, the decisions that will be taken um, going forward is just to note there isn't anything within that forward plan that I think would fall within this committee's um, terms of reference. Um, on the work programme, I just wanted to mention that we are going to have an an additional meeting on the 12th of December, so that was a meeting that was originally taken out of the calendar that we have put back in. 
um, that meeting will consider one another themed report from the joint health and wellbeing refresh strategy um, so that one is around empowering people in communities and um, on the 9th of january we will have a joint meeting with the family and children services committee um, and that's to consider again the last two health and wellbeing strategy refresh reports and they'll cover stuff around um, as we said earlier about education and around employment and housing um, and we'll also receive the adults and children safeguarding annual the adults and children safeguarding board annual report and um, this was previously two separate boards an adult one and a children one it's since merged and um, so we thought it would make sense to hold that joint committee with um, health and facts just to cover those three things that sort of delve across both sets of terms of reference um, and that'll be on the 9th of January but that that's it on the work program really um, unless anybody has I anything to add nobody to it. we might have a complicated day that day on the 12th I'll come to it yeah. um, 8.3 automated external defibrillators in the Thumbland scoping report now I, I brought this up last week in full council and I've had an awful lot of what I'd call correspondence, or could you say conflicting correspondence, and that's just from councillors. You know, someone says, you need to tell everybody where they are. Someone says, no, you don't. You shouldn't tell anybody where they are. So the way I see this going is it, 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 we, we, we obviously are looking at a problem and I don't know if you, anybody read your emails, but there's an extra million pound coming to support defibrillators. Yeah. So I, I, I think we need to be on the hunt out of this for just gathering information and getting what I would call the right people in the right room to tell us who is right, who is wrong, what the failures, if there are any, which there will be, of, of, of what we're doing uh, or what is being done out there. Everybody has uh, a conflicting, you know, Bridget was saying things like there's nine defibrillators in his valley or something, only six are registered. That's coming through. You know, that, that there's an awful lot of machines out there that are not in any system so really, the, what is the point? People are just putting them up willy-nilly. No one knows who has responsibility for them. There's a responsibility for them after. Who picks that bill up? And, uh, and, uh, and, and the ongoing, what I would call, keeping them going, keeping them used, or, or keeping them in, in, in condition. Again, we're going to bring in someone that knows what they're talking about, and we will have that in the council, but also NIAS, Ambulance Service, I think may have an input into this. Um, again, hugely conflicting things, because I was told that oh, there's one national road to get into them. Uh, and it says, oh, well, they'll talk you through. But if you live in an area where there's no mobile phone mm -hmm. coverage, you, you, you might have a problem. So all I'm saying is that we've hit a nerve here that we're going to have to look at this in depth and just gather to find out where we are, where we, if we're going wrong. As I say, the lifespan is when it's made, not when it's stuck on the wall. It could be three years old before it's stuck on the wall. Uh, and there are some horror stories where, you know, the battery's being flat. So I think we do need to do this in a control, not a control, but a, a, in a, we can't, this isn't going to be a quick fix. So, uh, Chris, are we one short of this meeting, of this number? I will be inviting, when we get there, Kath and I will be working on this, we, we will be inviting any interested party, that's councillors or beyond, to come and tell us what they think. And that's why I said on the 12th, we might be going to have this meeting on the 12th of December, so we can get into the new year. But, uh, that could be a problem. There's a planning. Planning follows at four o'clock. And if we start at one, by the time we get through the business and try and put this on the end, we might look at starting at 11 and trying to get through for one and then starting again at two. So we're out of here for planning at four. So that, that, that was me thinking in the pre-meeting. 
Does anybody want to say anything? But I do think we have a, in the words of Houston, we have a problem here. Right. Uh, well, the defibrillator is there no, there's no standard pads for them. And I have had a parish that I had to wait six months. Luckily, it wasn't out of use. It was just the pads that went out of date. We are told if the pads go out of date, they can still be used. But the, the, they had to wait six months on a set of pads coming in. And I think this is the sort of thing that we need to know. And it's the cost of the pads, pads and the batteries. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about inviting whoever it is from the town and parish. I think the town and parishes could have a role to play in this. They, they are closer to the ground on their little patches in some way, shape or form. The finance is something else because the, a lot of these have just gone up and I'm told that's about 400 quid for a battery and a, the pads. But, so that's every five years. So the, there's a longer rollout in this. Anybody else? Yeah, thanks, Chair. It's just that uh, the conclusion, when we look at it, we, we come up with suggestions, we bring it to a committee. What then do we do with that information? How do we change what's going on out there? Are we going to discuss that within this meeting? Well, I think that's the whole point of getting the correct information. What do we do? I mean, I mean at the moment, it's been like, oh, let's buy a face in heaven, as it were, sorry, it's fun. <laughs> and, and have a defibrillator. Now, it's the ongoing bit. Does it work? Will it work? Uh, is it registered? There's, there's so much, I wouldn't call it misinformation, but the, the, there's some black holes out there that we ain't got the bottom of. Uh, it, and I, I, I think we need to talk to what I call the experts. There'll, there'll be one in the county council, there'll be... There's about five councillors are experts in this, I tell you. I've got long emails from them. Um, but also NIAS and others that we think, and then who can take ownership of this, and the parish and town councils are probably best placed. That's just thinking that me and Kath came up with. But I think it was on everybody's mind in some way, shape or form. So really, everything's up in the air. What do we do with it? We take it, if we get a conclusion that we say we need X, Y, and Z, we take it to the cabinet here and say that's what we want. And if we don't get any anything out of them, we take it to NIAS and other people and say, we've got a problem here. That we've got all these defibrillators, but only half of them are known where they are and only half of them are working. So I, I think we, we've got to do something. So that's, that's my initial answer. Yeah. Um, just to say that the, the, the powers that this committee has um, in the legislation around health scrutiny is that we can, um, any recommendations that we make to the NHS, um, we can requ require a response within 28 days. Um, and we obviously have the right to scrutinise anything around the provision of healthcare services. So any recommendations we make um, to Cabinet, we can follow up. Any recommendations we make to the NHS, we can follow up and ensure that there's a... Um, an acceptable response to anything that we come up with. Um, and obviously the report on the task and finish group will come back to this committee as a whole um, for final approval before it goes to cabinet or um, any NHS partners. I think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's a really good idea. I've got to be honest with you because there's so many defibs out there that are not controlled by any council or anything community centre has put them up but the, there's nobody seems to take charge of most of them but your parish councils actually have got a lot put up so the thinking around it is about um finding out where they all are um about uh, uh, everything to do with the uh, different and then looking maybe it's looking to the council the parish councils to try and take some kind of ownership on all of them. And I think that's the way to look to it. I mean, depending on the costs, depending on the councils, and trying to bring it all in under bring it all into uniform, really. And that's what's needed because there's so many out there. Well you Les, you once said you had nineteen in Seaton Sluice. But but this this is the this is the problem we've got. Are the all through the parish councils, other through different ones. And that's what you find now, they're being offered more money 
to, to go towards small defibs. So if people are going to take up that offer, who's going to maintain them? Who's going to look after them once, once they use? I mean, a pad, as soon as it's been used, it's got to be changed straight away. Yeah, batteries are only five years, so it's, it's, it's just getting all the figures together and see who's going to, who, see who's going to manage them. Right, I've got Councillor Hill and Councillor Richard. It's just a, a, a note of caution in the way forward. Um, the town and parish councils are the obvious ones to take this forward. And I'm sure, well, I know there are one or two honourable exceptions, but most town and parish councils I know, if you said, we think it'd be a good idea, your best place, they'd go, or typical NCC, try to foist everything off on us. And most town and parish councils, I frankly wouldn't trust around a tripe shop, um, to be blunt, but just to be... Yes. <laughs> Why not? Um, um, but just, and that's a note of caution. And uh, you know, um, there's individual uh, people involved in town, and individual good ones. I'm not saying a hundred percent sweeping statement, but that is generally their tact. It's oh, typical NCC. Why can't they do it? Well, Kath more or less said what I was saying. I'm going to say I'm going. <laughs> uh, I think all town and parish councils. I do agree that they should take it on. They should know where every defibrillator is, but the cost of changing the stuff, will they get help because they might not have the, the funds and they need to get help from some way, like a fund bucket for when they need to change their batteries and that. They might not have the money. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's obviously, a, we've hit the nerve mm -hmm. here that because let's face it, defibrillators started coming in about five years ago, didn't it? or something like that, my memory, mm -hmm. means that some of them are going to be needing batteries. And I don't think anybody's made any provision no. for maintenance or whatever. I've got an email from another council saying that somebody does the training, and, that, mm -hmm. and I think all that information's got to come into the melting pot. I do have a list of what we're going to try and do, but I'll take less before we move on to that. Yeah, just on the back of what you were saying about uh, the list, as it were, uh, the register of them, who's going to take ownership of the register? Will it be Northumberland County Council? Or will, or will you just leave it to the parish? Because it, uh, a lot of parishes don't have the funds. Who's going to take ownership of the, the register? I'm sure by council, town council, when a defibrillator has been used, the council has been notified and the, one of the officers go around to change the, the pads and that. And I'm, I think that's what's happening now. Yeah. Well, I think this group is going to get to the bottom of this. Mm -hmm. Councillor Seymour, before I move on to this. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, just, um, I mean, I, I uh, helped a couple of um, places in Berwick uh, with defibrillators. One was the YHA, and they did allow in the funding, you know, to continue on maintaining it. Um, and the other one was the um, Berwick Community Trust. So they are taking it on, they're on their buildings, and they're looking after them. So I'm not quite sure how <laughs> they can be given to the, the council, the town, town and parish council. If they obviously, um, you know, I just not, I'm just not sure how that's going to work. If it's their property, they've paid for it and they've put it in on their building. Well, that be a problem, will they? But there'll be others where they're just. I'm just, just not sure if if it's, it's different places, yeah. uh, organisations that have put it on the, you know, but on their property. Then I'm not sure how they can be transferred to the town and school. parish council. That's all. It's just Again, conflict and stories because Councillor Hill from Berwick said you could, the town council couldn't run a tripe shop. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that. No. <laughs> You're all heartless up there. Never mind. Anyway, oh. Wait, can I just quickly yeah, see go on quickly. And we'll okay, uh, what we're on oh, what could happen is that might be um, managed very good, but at least the registration would lie with the uh, councils, with the parish councils, and that's all you need. And so there's, there's a log there 
to see exactly where these uh, defibs are so that everybody's aware of them. And that's basically what it's about. But I mean, this will all come out and when we have the task finished. Right. I'm on this page here and it says, consider the terms and reference scope of the review. I think we've, we've, we've probably heard that. You know, we're going to find out first of all and then agree a timetable for the review. Well, I'm, I'm hinting that the 12th of December is when we're going to have the next round of looking at this. After that, obviously, into the new year, it'll depend on the outcome of that. But I, I, I'm thinking of, because town and parishes are going to be linked into this, I need to think, is it Alan Sharp, who's town and parish rep? I'm not sure. Isabel? Isabel, you... Well, I'll cut to the chase. I think you need to get this on your agenda for the next big town and parish meeting. <coughs> Sorry, Chair, it is, but that's the end of January. Well, it can still go on there. All right, yeah, that, I'm quite happy to do that. You know, yes. e even if we've got a little saying to them, this is, this, is a, this is a problem and we're looking into it, at least give them a little bit of warning that, that something may be coming down their path. Um, Agree that the findings of the review will be reported to the Health and Wellbeing Overview and Scrutiny Committee. So we're all on it. So it comes back here, type thing. And Chris, you put in membership. Are we? What, what are we? Yeah. So um, obviously, the task and finish group is normally chaired by the vice chair. So that would be Councillor Nesbitt. Um, I've had Councillor Hunter has emailed and expressed um, an interest in being on the committee. Um, so I suppose just if you want, can you? I want you. You want to be on it, and then I suppose one more. Yeah. I thought we had a few more. Interest. You know, in, in, in how, how big is the committee? It can be as big as you like. Right. Who wants to be on? Probably Ms. Blairs. Councillor Richardson. I think we've got someone from Berwick, so all right. Um, and, uh, I think that's a good start. Um, right. And then we can invite those that are interested in to take evidence and extend yeah. it. But as a, as a core yeah, membership, a, that's that, that will be the core membership. We will be inviting so-called experts or people that have got more knowledge or more experience. And as I say, there's a lot of conflicting mm -hmm. emails I have, but, you know, totally. So I want to get to the bottom of this. Chair, would it be worth inviting Councillor Mather to join with these I've got, first I've got responder? about five councillors who have emailed me. I mean, it's Bridget, Mather, Kennedy, uh, Ferguson, and there was another one. You know, the, 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 they've got a real interest in the story to tell. I'd like, I'd like, I think, in this sort of gathering of information, find out good practice, find out where there's no practices. Or, 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 let, let's, let's just keep a, an, an open book on this. Right. Councillor Seymour, before we move on. Yeah, if it would help, uh, Chair, I, I'd be happy just to send a list of all the defibrillators that are in Berwick in the town. You know, I, I know there's... I think we'll come to that when we'll, we'll come to... That will come down the pipe. But uh, until we, we, we've decided what yeah. the full picture is, I think, yeah. I think let's just, just hang fire at the new year. And then we, 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 I mean, you can do that. It, it'll not be wasted. Because what we're going to have to do is find out where they are yeah. and does it match up with NIAS or whoever picks the phone up. Because they've got them outside churches and yeah. different community halls and the, the, places. They're like all that. over. And if there's a million quid coming, there's going to be a few more. Hmm. You've got two. Okay, right. Let's move on. That's yours. I don't think there's anything else. Yeah. Urgent business. I have none. Date of next meeting is the 12th of December. Watch that because that time might change if we get the ducks lined up. Okay, so we'll see you then. Thank you.